Okay, there are a variety of other uh, techniques now that we need to be sure we understand. One is the net present value. Now, the meaning of net present value would be uh, a situation where we have a project which requires an initial investment, which we'll denote here as a negative figure because that's cash paid out in year zero, 200 in this case, against which we have to calculate what the present values will be of the future cash flows. Here are the future values, and here are the present values of the future cash flows. And we've already calculated these cash flows previously. We said that they were equal to 426. And now the question becomes, is it worth spending $200 today in order to receive these cash flows? Well, the answer is yes, because these cash flows in the future from years one to five have a present value in today's terms of 426. The 200 initial investment of is deducted from the 426 to give us net present value of positive 226. And therefore, this is a good project to enter into. The internal rate of return is a special case. It is the it determines the discount rate at which the net present value of a series of cash flows is equal to zero. In other words, where the investment amount is exactly equal to the present value of the future cash flows. This is used for a, a variety of uh, investment uh, decision making uh, processes. This is, uh, we, we leave this for the reader to um, appreciate in terms of what the uh, IRR means. This is really more background um, appreciation of the method. And the comparison of net present value and internal rate of return methods as far as uh, making decisions um, in investment uh, proposals, uh, the real, uh, the ultimately, if there are conflicts or ambiguities between the two methods, we can uh, conclude that the net present value method takes priority. In other words, you cannot really go wrong if you follow the NPV uh, rule. And this is just to uh, show some examples where you can have anomalies arising um, between net present value calculations and IRRs. If we have two projects, A and B, for example, one can see that the IRR of the first project is 20%. That's higher than uh, for the IRR for project A is higher than for project B. But for the net present value calculation, depending on what the discount rate is, if the discount rate is 10%, then in fact project B would look more attractive. And so we have here some kind of uh, ambiguity arising, but again, um, the decision really should be that the NPV um, method takes priority and everything else should be um, subordinated to it. Here's the payback method, which is a simpler uh, method of calculating how fast an initial investment can be repaid. We can see here that if we add together 5 plus 6 is uh, makes 11,000 plus 12,000 is equal to a cumulated return of 23,000 and in the fourth year, 23 plus 13,000 gives us 36,000. We have to go a little bit into year five in order to fully recover the 40,000. So the payback is going to be somewhere uh, within year five, four years plus several, several months. For Project B, if the cash flows are coming in quicker up front, we can see here that the 40,000 is recovered after three years. That's 15,000 
plus 13,000, that makes accumulation of 28,000. And then the third year, by the end of the third year, another 12,000 is recovered, which gives us exactly 40,000. So the payback method is measuring the n amount of time necessary for the cash flows to add up to the initial investment. And one can see the advantages and disadvantages are summarized here of of the payback method. The discounted payback method is interesting because uh, instead of counting the simple cash flows in the future from a project, it discounts them to a present value and then it adds them up or accumulates them until the initial investment amount is covered. This means that whereas the simple payback method, the nominal values themselves, the future values themselves, would have a two-year payback. You can see here is 100 plus 100 is exactly equal to 200. But when we discount those numbers and apply the discounted payback method, then we can see it takes longer to reach 200. It's going to be 90.9 plus 82.6. That makes 173.5, and we have to go into the third year to finally reach 200. So those are some basic principles with regard to uh, investment um, management and investment appraisal. Let's uh, cover some issues now in uh, cash management, cash and cash flow. The cash, of course, is referring to the amount of cash and near cash, uh, highly liquid uh, investments that can be quickly converted into cash, which are found in the balance sheet of the financial statements of the company. Whereas cash flow is actually a separate report which shows the movement of cash over time. And this is a very important concept because Cash flow is the means by which by which companies are able to pay their expenses, to pay their interest on, on debt, to be repay loans, to pay dividends to uh, shareholders and so on. So we have to keep our eye carefully on cash management. Now the uh, here's some examples of cash receipts and payments in a company. We have the operating cash, that's the cash received from selling things to customers and the cash that's paid to suppliers. Then there's the financing um, cash receipts and payments. And this would be an example of this would be cash paid for uh, interest on either deposit interest that would be cash coming in or interest uh, on loans that have to be paid out. Then there's uh, taxation the cash paid for taxes, the cash flows that are paid for making investments, that is buying assets for the business, like an automobile or a piece of machinery. And there's another kind of financing cash flow, which is relating to the borrowing and repayment of loans, or for example, issuing shares or bonds the market in order to raise additional cash. Now this uh, the difference between uh, cash flow accounting and uh, accounting for income and expenditures on an accruals basis lies in the um, application of a matching principle in financial accounting. That is uh, for a given period um, associating revenues and uh, expenses in, in a way that um, realistically captures when those revenues are earned and when those uh, expenses uh, have actually been incurred, even if cash hasn't already uh, been used for uh, settlement purposes. Um, Cash flow accounting, of course, is kind of a parallel system in its own right because if the company doesn't have enough cash to 
to be able to operate with it's going to go out of business fairly quickly so uh, planning the tra and tracking cash is very important and here are some cash management functions which are uh, typically part of the responsibilities of a treasurer of course it's clear that cash budgets are also a necessary part of the planning process in business in order to draw up cash budget forecasts and this involves um, making assumptions about the cash outflows from a business in other words the expenses that have to be made and also the investing and also the cash inflows that can be achieved through selling things but also through the raising of finance so this is a rather important and uh, very highly detailed area that needs to be uh, gotten right and of course a uh, cash manager um, gets better with experience as they get a better feel for what uh, drives the timing of cash flows in and out of the business of course if the company is in a in a uh, favorable position of actually generating cash surpluses it can um, invest those surpluses into various types of investments or indeed pay the cash out in the form of a dividend finally the last section here to to uh, be mentioned is the use of spreadsheets but of course this has been uh, covered as well in the uh, management information paper and the same remarks apply that um, anyone in a business managerial position should have a basic grasp of the use of spreadsheets because they are enormously important in terms of being able to um, uh, process data in a systematic and in an efficient way.